absolutely. Good morning. How you doing? Wow, we're growing. Look, it's awesome. Oh, come on, come on. Don't, don't wipe me this morning. We're growing. Thank you. Wow. You know, when I'm away from this family, I preach in Baptist churches and Catholic churches, and not, not churches, but Catholic events and stuff like that, and they're all great, but nobody says a good amen like my church on the hill, baby, and so I want you to be with me, all right? Um, I've been asked to speak about, as part of this great series on men and women, didn't Elise do a great job last week for those of you who are here? She talked about Proverbs 31. Proverbs 31 is rich. It's about women for the most part. And it's been used because it's been misunderstood to basically be the basis for women being barefoot pregnant in the kitchen. Now, I'm crazy about my wife, and I want her barefoot pregnant in the kitchen, but I want her everywhere else in the world too, right? I've got a daughter. I want her to be the president, the pope, the queen, the CEO, the general, everything in the whole world. And Proverbs 31 is really a mandate for all that. So I was so proud of Elise. It was great. They're at a wedding this weekend, so you got me. On, set, on Thursday... Uh, I kind of fin helped finish off the women's conference, the women, uh, Every Nation Pastors of Wives, they called them, um, on Thursday finished their conference, and they had scheduled last year with me to do a, a tour of D.C. So I took them around for a day and toured them around D.C. I'm kind of geeky about the monuments. Remember, you know, Mr. Smith goes to Washington, me, that's me. There it is, you know, and it's the Washington Monument, and, I, and my wife is like, shut up. And so uh, I took them around. By the end of the day, I thought all the men in every nation should resign, and these women should be running the movement. Right? I mean, it was unbelievable. It was unbelievable. And then I wrote a couple of the male leaders saying that that was what should happen. They said, oh, that happened years ago. So, um, so I love the women. I love the strength of women. I love the gifts of women. I'm married to a strong, leading woman. I love all of that. Um, but I am called, uh, to a, in a large part of what I do, to impact men. And uh, it's, it's interesting to me that today we have a mission, what's called a Mission Sunday, and we're talking about men. Because I say this with all love for men whom I love, and, and i got to tell you, I love man culture. I love men. I love what they can do. I love what they're called to do. I love men of God. But they are today a mission field, uh, not just because we need more Christian men, but we need to help uh, reverse the downward trajectory of men in our time. In our world, men, especially in the Western world, men are in decline by every measurable standard. Men are getting fewer degrees, uh, college and graduate degrees. Men are in lesser health. They're earning less. Their relationships are broken for the most part. I mean, this, this is all based on statistics, not just what I'm saying. And so men in the Western world are in crisis. If you live in England and you die uh, early, let's say right around 50 years old, and it wasn't for a cardiac reason, do you know what it was for? It was suicide. And when we do the psychological postmortem, you know what we find out? That men die because they feel like they've made too big a mess of their lives or there's not a man nearby who cares about them. They love their moms and their sisters, but they write in the suicide notes, there's not a man nearby who even knows what's going on with me. The boys are in worse shape. We won't even go there now. Boys in America are in worse shape. They are declining. Uh, they are filling up the special needs courses uh, in schools. They are declining in academic performance. Their bodies are undergoing weird transformation because of their sedentary lifestyles and the video games and so on. And so I am here to bring the good news. <laughs> and I know I tend to start, start with the, some of the stark news, but, but I'm saying that because I want to see men arise in our generation. Generation. I, I do. So don't feel like if you come here this morning, women, it's like, uh-oh, it's going to be for men. I should have come. I knew I should have stayed home and watched TV. No, it's going to be for you too. But, but I want to tell you why I'm talking about what I'm talking about. It's not just that Stephen said, hey, take number two in this series. Um, it's that I care about men in our time. And because many men feel like they can't be great men because they've messed up in their lives in some way, uh, I want to use a story in the Bible that we often miss. I have a little bit of a mischievous personality, and I like the nitty-gritty in the Bible. I know there's the high and the holy and the Lord high and lifted up and so on, and I love him and I worship him. 
But the Bible's also written with the nitty-gritty. It doesn't hide stuff from us, right? It tells us that people misbehaved. It, Paul is, you know, a little, little unusual, right? I mean, Paul, come on. Some of these people in the Bible are a little unusual. I like that John say, said, I ran to the tomb and I outran Peter. I mean, that's just a man talking, right? There's no reason for that to be in the Bible. And so I want to look at a story today that's very much like that, where the Holy Spirit, who inspired Scripture, left some stuff, and that didn't just leave it there, he put it there for our purposes. And I want to talk about Mark. In fact, when we took it down, it's okay, you guys, you don't have to change it. Uh, I, I, I'm calling this the story of Mark making of a man. Because Mark, I'm talking about the Mark, was a massive mess early in his life. In fact, I use to, to introduce this series... Uh, one of the weirdest scriptures in the entire New Testament. It's Mark 14 and verse 51 carries on to verse 52. You do not have this in your promise boxes. You do not have this on your refrigerator. You have not memorized this verse. There's no juice in this verse, okay? It's just weird. Jesus has just been arrested. The deed is done. The chapter should end, right? But in Mark 14 and verse 51, it goes on to say this. A young man wearing nothing but a linen garment was following Jesus. And when they tried to seize him, speaking of the Romans, Roman soldiers, when they tried to seize him, he fled naked, leaving his garment behind. I mean, it's happening at the arrest of Jesus, so it's important. What's it doing in the Bible? I'm just trying to figure this out. What's it doing in the Bible? Well, I want to tell you, when you put the whole story together like I'm going to do this morning, you see why it's important, because this is Mark. This is Mark. Remember, this is from the Gospel of Mark, and it's the kind of thing a person would remember, right? That you went to Jesus, you were there when he got arrested, the Romans reached for you because they thought maybe you were one of his followers, you were only wrapped in a sheet, I'll tell you why in a minute. They grabbed the sheet, you ran away naked, it's the kind of thing that makes an impression in your brain, okay? So later, years later, when Mark's writing his gospel, he remembers that moment, and the Holy Spirit, how should I say it, allows him, empowers him, gives permission, uses him to remember that moment on the page. And I want to say it this way because it's going to be significant for the way uh, that the story unfolds. This is the first time Mark ran away. You can tell by the way I said that, he's going to run away again, and that's the crux of the story. So what's going on here? Let's talk about Mark real quick. Well, Mark is the son, the New Testament tells us, of a wealthy woman who owns a house in Jerusalem. And some significant things in the New Testament history, especially in the book of Acts, happen in this house. A father is never mentioned. Now, there was obviously a biological father, but no father is ever mentioned. He's not in the story. So, for example, in Acts 12, when Paul is released from prison, Peter is released from prison, uh, the Bible says uh, that when he, you, you, you know this story, Peter's in prison, he gets released by an angel, he thinks it's a dream. When he comes out, Acts 12, 12, you don't have to go there. Um, it says, when, when this had dawned on him, that it's not a dream, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark. This is the Mark we're talking about. And where many people had gathered and were praying. There were other times where they gathered th at this house. So in other words, uh, a wealthy woman who was an early believer had a big house in Jerusalem, and uh, believers often gathered there. And Mark, who's also called John Mark, I'm just going to call him Mark, he was the son. So he grows up in the house of a single mom. He grows up in the house of a wealthy mom. He grows up in a big house. There's air conditioning. There's Nintendo. There's a jacuzzi, right? Come on. You got you to use your imagination. You got to have some fun with the text. He's a little spoiled maybe, all right? We find this out. Now, now let me just wrap up the, the, the story I started with. Why is he standing at the arrest of Jesus naked? Well, scholars tell us that the Last Supper happened in Mark's mother's house. Doesn't that make sense? She's got a big house in Jerusalem and she was known to Jesus. So the last supper of Jesus happens in Mark's mother's house. 
Well, so the Last Supper's over. They, everybody in the house goes to sleep. Jesus and his disciples go up to the Mount of Olives. But the Romans have heard that the Last Supper was taking place in Mark's parents' house. So what happens that night that Jesus is arrested? Roman soldiers come and knock on the door. Where's Jesus? Mark is, we think he's about 13 at this point, okay? He's wrapped in a sheet, sleeping naked. I don't know why he did it. He didn't have PJs that day. I don't know what the deal was, but he's sleeping naked. He gets up and he runs out to where he knows Jesus is to warn him. Doesn't that make perfect sense? So he's standing. That's why we've got the first streaker in the Bible, okay? He's wrapped in a sheet. He's standing there when Jesus is arrested. He doesn't know what to do. He's horrified. You know, a high priest's assistant gets his ears cut off, and Jesus rebukes Peter at Mark's 13, and he's wide-eyed. Oh, my gosh, what's going on? And suddenly some big Roman soldier reaches for him, only gets a handful of sheet, and Mark runs off naked, having to make his way back through Jerusalem to his parents' house naked. Maybe he steals something off a clothing line. I don't know. My imagination goes all kinds of places. But my point is, he will remember that, and he put it in the Bible. So get a picture of Mark at this point at the arrest of Jesus. He's early teens. He's grown up in the house of a single mom. She's wealthy. Don't know why. Got a big house. Church is often meeting there, okay? He's a good kid, but he's a little bit spoiled, a little bit self-centered. You're going to see why I think that in a few minutes. And now we come down to the next part of the story. That's just the start. That's just the fun start. What's this guy doing running naked around Jerusalem when Jesus is being arrested? But now, if I tell you that's the first time he ran away, there was a second time. As the early church grows and Mark, young Mark is known to the disciples and he's growing up and he's in this woman's home and the church often meets there. We see that in Acts chapter 12 and verse 12. The church often meets there whenever they convene for prayer or, or come together. They're often in Mark's mother's home. So Mark is known to them. And we come down to Acts 13, okay? And in Acts 13, the first missionaries, thank God Caroline's here to hear me expound on the first missionaries, um, the first missionaries in Acts 13 are commissioned. The, Holy, the, the teachers and prophets are together. What does the Bible tell us in Acts 13? That the Holy Spirit speaks and says, separate unto me Paul and Barnabas for the work whereunto I've called them. This is awesome. It's the first time that anybody is called out to go out as missionaries. So that church at Antioch, which is what we're talking about here, big sending church through the years, this is the beginning of it. They lay their hands on Paul and Barnabas, and they commission them to go forth. I haven't left our story. It says in Acts 15 and verse 8, it says, I'm sorry, in verse 5, it says, John went with them as their helper. Now, John isn't still 13. He's older. He's in his 20s. But he's still living with his mother. And the, and the young, the, 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 these two, like Billy Grahams of the generation are, who are commissioned by the church of Antioch, they say, hey, go preach the gospel to the non-believers. And Paul and Barnabas say, we'll take Mark with us. Well, it was probably a good idea, but it didn't end well. If, you st if you're looking at Acts 13, or if you, I know you've read it before, Acts 13, verse 5, it says, John was with them as their helper. They go. They start to preach the gospel amongst the pagans. There are signs and wonders. There are confrontations. And you get down to Acts 13 and verse 13, eight verses later, and here's what it says. It was in Perga where John left them to return to Jerusalem. Now, I know you can't tell from what I've just read necessarily that this is a bad thing, but you're going to find out in a minute when I read something else to you from the Bible, it was a bad thing. It wasn't good that John left. John didn't make it eight verses into that first missionary journey, right? And already he's missing the jacuzzi, he's missing the air conditioning, he's missing mom's cooking, he's missing the Nintendo, come on, work with me. He's missing, he's missing whatever, you know, he's missing Netflix and, uh, and Amazon on his Roku TV. I mean, I just, we can have all kinds of fun with this. He's missing uh, that DoorDash delivery. If we had more time, I'd have you suggest some images, but you see where I'm going, right? He's the kind of a spoiled 20-something kid who's been living with a rich single mom for a long time. And so he abandons them. 
Now, at this point, if you're just reading along, you don't know that anything really is wrong because it hasn't said that bad, terrible, un- disobedient, spoiled Mark left them. But we get through the first missionary journey, Acts 13, Acts 14, and we come to Acts 15, which is the Council of Jerusalem. Now, this is the big first church council where they decide whether the Gentiles have to do all the things Jews do, circumcision and observing the law in order to be Christians. And of course, the church decides, the council decides, the Gentiles don't have to become Jews first to become Christians. And it's a big moment that opens up the preaching of the gospel. But at the end of the chapter... At the end of Acts 15, something happens that tells us really what's going on with the whole story here about Mark. Keep your eye on Mark. Because Paul turns to Barnabas and says, let's go back and visit the churches where we were, where we preached the gospel in our first missionary journey, which is Acts 13 and Acts 14. Barnabas says, great. And then he says the words that send Paul over the edge. He says, great, let's take Mark. Now let's pause for a moment, freeze the scene. What you don't know is that Barnabas is Mark's cousin. He likes the kid. He's a good kid. I grew up with him. You also need to know that Barnabas isn't Barnabas' real name. It's Joseph. But the disciples called Barnabas Barnabas rather than Joseph because Barnabas means son of encouragement. Do you see the picture starting to form here? Barnabas is his relative. He's got a mercy gift. He's relational. (laughs) Come on, you know what I'm talking about, right? This is Barnabas standing over here. Here's Paul. We have a description of Paul from an outside of the Bible early document. He was so bow-legged, it said, you could walk a goat through his legs. He was short, he was bald, and his eyebrows looked like two caterpillars colliding in the middle of his forehead. That's what it says. I I didn't make that up. That's actually what it says. Paul is a man on a mission. You guys have had this tension before, right? Paul's missions oriented. Sorry. He is hard hitting. Let's get it done, baby. My way or the highway. Let's go. We f- you feel that with Paul in some of the New Testament. And every so often he'll show his attitude. Like he's talking about the other disciples. He goes, well, I guess I'm not part of the super apostles. You know, he's having that kind of, right? You've read that. I didn't make that up. That's in the New Testament. I'm not putting him down. I'm just saying these guys have personalities and the Holy Spirit's using. So here's Mr. Son of Encouragement, the cousin of Mark. He's, let's take him. We can work with him. He's a good boy. And here's Paul going, I ain't taking that kid to the bathroom. I'm not doing anything with him. You kidding? Now watch the language. Now that I've described all that, let that settle on the text. Sometime after the uh, Council of Jerusalem, I read um, here at the end of Acts 15, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we we preach the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. Now see, we read this kind of religiously. Oh, they went back and watch this. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them. But Paul did not think it wise to take him. Because he had deserted them. Ah, now we see that they're really ticked off about him leaving that first time. The first time they said, well, he went away. They were being polite. Now Paul just goes, no, he dumped us. Are you kidding? I'm not taking him anywhere. That's the Stephen Mansfield translation of the Greek. They deserted him in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. Listen to verse 39 of Acts 15. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. The Holy Spirit had put Paul and Barnabas together, but they fought so hard over Mark and whether to take him, they parted company. Even though the New Testament doesn't tell you, I can tell you, they never worked together again, even though the Holy Spirit had put them together as a team. And why? Because of Mark. Stick with me. Stick with me. They had such a sharp disagreement that, disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and left, watch the code language here, commended by the believers to the grace of the Lord. So everybody's ticked off at Mark. 
And Barnabas, his cousin, son of encouragement, takes him and goes back to his homeland of Cyprus, an island out in the Mediterranean. Paul gets Silas. The people bless him, hmm, sneering at Mark and Barnabas as they leave. I know it doesn't sound like New Testament Christians. I, I, I know that no Christians today ever fight, right? They never, it's just all peace and love. You've never had any hassles with any Christians. Don't look at me like that. So the Christians are like, huh, we'll lay hands on Paul and bless him with Silas as he goes to do the ministry. And we're glad that Barnabas and that nitwit Mark have gone off to Cyprus. Now, everything I've said is pretty much what happened with a little bit of humor thrown in. Everybody's ticked off at Mark because he's a spoiled little brat who, who split Charles Stanley and Billy Graham ministry team. T.D. Jakes and Billy Graham were on a mission team, and some little spoiled twerp went back to mommy and split the greatest team in the entire generation. Do you feel it now? That's what was going on. That's what was going on. And for years, Barnabas is at Cyprus. We never see Barnabas again in the New Testament. He's referred to, but only in memory. We never see him again. He takes Paul, Mark back to, his, to Cyprus, and Paul continues to minister the gospel. What a mess is Mark. What a spoiled little twerp is he. Sure, I'm glad he went back to Cyprus. I know God can't use anybody like that. That's what people were thinking. And that Barnabas, he's such a relational son of encouragement. He can encourage Mark back at Cyprus. We don't want him here in Jerusalem making a mess. I know I'm making it harsh, but they were sinners then too. And they thought just like we think today. And that would have, that would have been at the end of it. Matter of fact, probably, I don't know if the Holy Spirit would have put it in the Bible. I don't know if he would have told us a story that didn't eventually turn around. Barnabas is at Cyprus for years with Mark. What's he doing? Well, to know the answer to that, you have to have seen the movie Karate Kid. Come on. Help me, brothers. Wax on, wax off. Wah, right? Wah. Wax on, wax off. He's working him, isn't he? He's teaching him. He's having him, you know, wax on, wax off, used cars. I'm just imagining things. He's teaching him stuff. He's pouring character in him. He's saying, hey, the story's not written yet. Let's get out of here to Cyprus. We're going to minister the gospel here. I'm going to teach you some stuff. Wax on, wax off, so to speak. Teaching him and training him. And that would have been the end of the story, except that years later, suddenly, Mark is back. He's back. And in Colossians 4 and verse 10, you don't have to turn there. I'll read it to you. And besides that, you're not using God's version of a Bible, the NIV. So let me read it to you in the true version of God, the Holy... I'm just playing. Colossians 4.10. Paul's ranting on here, and he's not ranting, he's talking. He says, my fellow prisoner Aristarchus sends you his greeting. You know, he's at the end of the book, the stuff you skip because you want to go on, you know, and get, 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 finish the chapter. As to, he says, my fellow prisoner Aristarchus sends you his greetings, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. It's been years. Nobody's heard about Mark. These words, if you had an audio Bible, would echo. As does Mark, 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 the cousin of Barnabas, 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 Barnabas. And then he says this in a parenthesis. You've received instructions about him. If he comes to you, welcome him. What? Paul was so ticked off at Mark, he was in a sharp disagreement. He got ticked. I'm not taking him anywhere. Boom. He takes Silas. He goes. The church blesses it. And then, but somehow in the intervening years, there's been a reconciliation. Because Paul is telling the whole church now, because all the church knows the bad story about Mark, being a nitwit and breaking up T.D. Jakes and Billy Graham. But then suddenly Paul says, you know what? Uh, Mark is going to come, is here, and you've received instructions about him. If I send him to you, welcome him. Be nice to him, you turkeys. That's what he's saying. It keeps on going. Uh, in Philemon chapter 1, verse 23, again, Paul is just sending the greetings like he does at the end of the letters. And he says, Epaphras, my fellow prison in Christ Jesus, sends you his greeting. And so does Mark. And he moves right on. Aristarchus, Demas, others, 
Luke, wait a minute, Mark's back, but we haven't got a clear story. Then Peter, in 1 Peter, uh, it, it says here that Peter has become, I'm sorry, Mark has become Peter's son, meaning in the ministry. He's become his son. Uh, verse 5 and verse 13 of 1 Peter says, She who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends, her, sends you her greeting, as does my son Mark. What's happened? There's been some kind of reconciliation. Paul and Mark have talked. Uh, he's, Paul is starting to tell other people, hey, something's changed. If he comes to you, be nice to him. Welcome him. He's with Peter. He's being discipled by Peter and, and being of some use to Peter, obviously. Peter says, Mark's with me too. He's become my son. It's his way of saying, he's back. Leave him alone. And then to really bring the story to this big apex, in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 11, the last, this is the last book Paul ever writes. He's in prison. He's going to die soon. This is the last book he ever writes in the New Testament. Look what he says in his last instructions. Get Mark and bring him with you because he's helpful to me in my ministry. Those are some sweet words right there. Get Mark because he's helpful to me. Now, hold that up next to the end of Acts 15 when Paul is saying, get that twerp out of my face. And then years later, he says, get Mark. I'm dying. Get Mark and bring him to me because he's helpful to me. So Mark has been serving behind the scenes. He's been serving Peter. He's been serving Paul. And by the end of his life, Paul is able to put this big crown on Peter's head. I'm sorry, on Mark's head in the words, get Mark and bring him to me. I'm in prison in Rome. I want to see him one more time because he's useful to me in the ministry. Well, we know more of the story. I'll let her preach if she wants. Let him preach. It's cool with me. There's more to the story. We know what happened after Paul died. Mark became the bishop of Alexandria. Now, you got to know a little ancient history to know that Alexandria, not the one here, guys, but the one in uh, Egypt, one of the biggest cities in the ancient world, and it had the largest library in the world. And Mark became the bishop of that city. He was the man over all the churches in that city for years. And eventually... A big outbreak occurred against the Christians, and they were burning copies of the Bible. And Eusebius, the church historian, tells us that Mark would not give up the Bible, who would not give up copies of the Bible, and so they put him to death. And do you know what his tombstone said? We don't have it anymore, of course, but Eusebius says his tombstone was, and Mark was martyred. This time, he did not run away. Oh. Now, come on. You see why I emphasize so much the naked run? This time. He did not run away. So the little twerp, the little spoiled brat, the little Nintendo addict, the little whatever, however you want to play it in your brain, who had messed up big, he's one of the most criticized people in the New Testament in terms of, you know, the sense we have of the people being upset about him. And what happens? He goes through a process and he becomes useful. He becomes useful to the most powerful men of God on the planet. And in time, he takes leadership himself, and he's epic. By the way, I haven't even mentioned the fact he wrote one of the four Gospels. I mean, you can't get any better in usefulness to Jesus than writing a Gospel, I mean, for heaven's sakes. So his life is redeemed from being a mess and being spoiled and being the son of a, of, of a rich single mom. And, and, and that's, not a, that's not a fault, of course, um, but being spoiled and self-centered and abandoning these guys who are giving you an opportunity. And, and then you go and you, you're discipled by your encouragement-oriented cousin, and he's doing wax on and wax off, and eventually you come back. And what I want to talk about now, just in the last few minutes, is, is what were the steps that Mark underwent that took him from being one of the biggest mess-ups in the New Testament to being a man who wrote a gospel, led one of the biggest cities in the ancient world for Jesus, and was martyred for the cause of Christ, celebrated for the fact that this time he didn't run away. He'd run away at the crucifixion, of, at the arrest of Jesus. He'd run away from the apostles as they were ministering. But in the end of his life, he'd been changed. What is the change? Because my reason for saying all this, as much as I obviously enjoy telling the story, is, and I like us to see the Bible in a new and fresh and human light, but the reason that I'm telling the story is that 
I work a lot with men in our generation, and many of them think they've messed up too badly to be useful or to be good men or to be noble men. The organization I run is called Great Man Global. You run the great and the man together as though it's one word. Great Man Global. I believe there's greatness in men. I want to call it out. I want to see them accomplish that. I want it for women too. It's just not what I'm primarily called to. So I take them on tours of DC and eat with them. That's how I encourage that. But whatever, that's somebody else's job. My friend Beth Moore will do that. What I'm about is over here with the men going, there's greatness and men rise up. And no man in here is messed up. No man in the sound of my voice, no man that I speak to in the world is messed up as bad as Mark. I mean, I realize there's moral issues and so on, but this guy like messed up on international television, right? He's got the whole Christian church thinking he's like the Antichrist, right? You follow what I'm saying? Amen. But what did he do that turned it around? Because it's partly the work of Barnabas, and partly the work of Paul, and partly the work of Peter, who cared for him eventually and loved him and made him a son. But it's also Paul, I mean, Mark had to respond the right way. So real quickly here at the end of this, this talk, guys, listen up. And you have my permission, man or woman, you're sitting next to a guy, he ain't listening, punch him in the arm. <laughs> I know the guys are with me. First of all, he submitted himself. Men don't like that. Nobody likes it. We got a will. We got our own. We, we think we're the Marlboro Man. We think we're Daniel Boone going out and doing it on our own. We think we're a Lone Ranger. But when you make a mess out of your life, you got to reach out of the swirl and out of the mess, and you got to grab onto something firm. We want that to be Jesus, but we also want that to be people who know Jesus and know what's good for your life. And any man you respect, who are the people you respect in our, in our family, just in our family? You respect Mark. You respect Stephen. You respect Bishop Brett. You respect my nitwit. I'm sorry. You respect Jim LaFoon. You, res you respect <laughs> my idiot. I'm sorry. You respect Jim Critcher. I'm just having fun. These are my buddies. You respect them. But I'll tell you what. They submit to people. They ask people to speak in their lives. I'm an older and, as you've heard, fairly accomplished person. You can't believe the number of men that I submit to right now in my life. Submit like I go mow the yard and then sit on my knees at the back door waiting for some food. No, that's, um, that's not submission. That's some weird, no. But I say, <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm talking about, don't you? No, but I'm talking about, hey, speak into my life, man. I, I want to hear you. Bishop Brett calls. Jim LaFoon calls me. Any time of night, they, have, they can talk to my wife anytime they want. Why? Because I have special problems? No, I don't have special problems because I don't want to have special problems. I want to be a man. I want to be a righteous man. I mean, I've walked out of the White House and had Jim LaFoon on the phone. Okay, I, I just sent something for you. I, that's what I want. That's probably why I'm able to be in the White House, because I got people watching out for my life, right? Making sure I'm eating one Oreo and not 50. Making sure maybe I'm having one glass of wine and not 200. You understand what I'm saying? Making sure I'm only five pounds overweight and not 500. <laughs> Work with me here. Work with me just for a moment. Don't, the spirit of conviction leave. We're all in the same place, right? <laughs> only Stephen Law doesn't have to think about that stuff, and I'm not happy about it, all right? You understand what I'm trying to say? Why don't I have more problems? Because I have good men with eyes on me. And I'm open to what they have to say. He submitted himself. Number two, he faced his wrongs. At some part, point, Mark had to come back from Cyprus and plant himself again in Jerusalem where he had messed things up. He had, as they say today, fouled the nest. But he had to come back. He had to look at the very people who were ticked off at him. He probably had to look in the eyes of the very people who had commissioned Paul and Barnabas to do missions. And there he stands, probably in his early 30s. I know I messed up, but I think I'm think I still got something to contribute here. And here's a letter from Barnabas, and he thinks I'm okay. And would you take me back? He had to face what he did wrong. Don't run. Face it. Face it. Number three, he got mentoring. He got mentoring. We tend to think of kind of a platonic version of mentoring, which is a bunch of guys sitting around in togas under a tree talking about the birds or something. But mentoring, you got a mentor, call it discipling if you want, you got a mentor, it's just somebody working, on, working with you in a certain area of your life, right? I mean, I mean I, I've, I've asked Stephen Law to, hey, help me understand something a little bit more. He mentored me for a while. I'm twice his age, but, but he can mentor me in something. I want to get better. I want to get good at this. Some of you are really good at, at I don't know, 
uh, martial arts, or you're really good at, uh, at invest day trading, or you're really good at something I'm not good at. Well, let's go sit together. I may be twice your age. I may have more degree. I, whatever. I don't know what I've got that you don't have. But mentor me. I want to be taught. I want to be good. I want to be better. Tell me what the heck's going on with my car. What in the world is Apple thinking? What's happening on my computer? Teach me stuff. I want to be good. I want to be effective. You understand what I'm saying? That's what mentoring is. And in spiritual things, you got to have it. You think it's just you, you a Bible, and Jesus in your, in your bedroom, you're going to miss a lot of stuff. Don't you want to learn from people who know the fast track on how to get things done? Do you want to learn everything from scratch like it's day one of Christianity? No. Let's be taught. Let's be trained. So he got mentoring. Number four, he served. You made a mess, you're going to have to serve your way out of it. You're going to have to serve your way out of it. Men, you messed up, hurt your wife, you got to love them. Got to be gentle. You got to repent. You got to serve your way out of it. My wife and I may even make a joke of this. Well, you were late. I know, baby. I just I couldn't fly the plane any faster to get there any earlier. Well, I'm gonna have. You're gonna have to cook some dinner now. That's all there is. You're just gonna have. To, that's that's how Bev is. She's like, well, you'll have to cook some dinner, and I think I'm gonna need both feet massaged. That's what we're just playing. We're just playing, but we're playing off the fact that you got to serve your way out of being in the doghouse. I don't just mean men and women. I mean in, in life, right? I've, I've made some mistakes in my life. I've hurt some people. You know, we all, parents disappoint their children. Husbands, wives disappoint their spouses. You got to serve. And Mark did. He served. He served Paul. That's how he became useful in ministry. He served Peter. That's how he became a son. He put himself in a situation of serving, and that put him on the conveyor belt and the trajectory to the heights that he achieved. Number five, he received fathering. Now, fathering is different, different from mentoring, Right? You want me to mentor you? Maybe you want to know how to write a book. Mark was joking about this earlier. I've written 27, far too much more, far more than a human being ought to. I'll be happy to help. I'll talk to him for a while. We'll have a hamburger. I'll give him some thoughts. Maybe see the book in a year. I'll help edit it. That, that's, that's a little bit of mentoring in, a, in an area. It's modular mentoring. I need his help with guitar, or I need his help with what, his prophetic insight, or I need his help with knowing DC and why the E's go this way and the H, the H just anyway, whatever. I, I need help. But, but fathering is a different thing now. Fathering, I can speak to anything in your life. You can speak to anything in my life. Why, you sure that girl's the right girl to date? You sure? Um, i got to teach you some things about table manners because you eat like a warthog. You know what I mean? That, a father can say that, right? A mentor doesn't have right to just roam where a father can say some things. A father can talk about destiny. A father can talk about what's in the soul. A father can draw things out. Number six, he made himself essential. That's not manipulation. That's not politics. He made himself essential. I'm trying to make myself essential. I want to be essential to this church. I want to be essential to my wife. I want to be essential to my children. Not in some manipulative way. I want to live a life of such weight and value and strength and wisdom. And yeah, praise and work hard and earn, earn prosperity and, and ask God to bless so I can do things and fund things and make things happen. Sure. I want to be essential. I want to live a life that's, when I die, I want them weeping. Don't you? I mean, I, I mean that semi-humorously, but don't, I don't want to die and have somebody go, well, where, is he dead? I didn't know. That happened five years ago. What are you talking about? No, I want, I want to be missed. I want to, make a, I want to have an impact. I want to make myself essential. And Mark got in there knowing he was suspected and made himself essential so that Paul said at the end of his life, bring him to me. He's one of the last people I want to lay eyes on in this life because he's useful to me in ministry. That was the change. And then he dared to assume leadership. Listen to me. The key to greatness is taking responsibility. A lot of men today are trying to avoid being responsible for anything. And I have a slightly different attitude. Lord, show me what I'm supposed to be responsible for, and I'll own it. I can't be responsible for everything. Right? That produces burnout. But show me the field assigned to me. I'll take responsibility. Nothing will move in that field that I don't bless and pray for and know about and help and encourage and cause everything to thrive. Clearly, Mark was willing to do that. He went from being the despised one in Jerusalem to the senior Christian leader in a city many, many times larger than Jerusalem and gave his life for the cause of Christ. And by the way, they clearly all knew his story. They all knew his mess-ups. Because they wrote on his tombstone, well, this time he didn't run away. He ran away at the rest of Jesus. He ran away from Paul and Barnabas, but this time he didn't run away. 
I want you to see the story a different way. I want you to see it as a man's story. Not to take anything away from you ladies because it's your story too. But men, you've not made a big enough mess Amen. to be kept from greatness. You've got to do the things that you see Mark doing. And I love that God left this in the, on the Bible. I love that he, it's not just all, the whole, the whole New Testament is not just saints floating a foot off the ground with wings. You follow what I'm saying? I love that we're down in the mud and the blood and the beer, so to speak. Maybe not the beer for some of you, but anyway, for some of us, just saying. I love that we're in the nitty-gritty, right? Because it inspires us. May the Lord cause us. Look up here, we're going to do this Hebrew style. May the Lord cause us to look full in the face our failures, our deformities, and our messes. May we repent. May we welcome the outside influence we need to have. May we rise through it, wax on, wax off in every way. And may we lead to the glory of God in our generation. Amen.